change his heart you can't change people's feelings you can't change society the best the best result you can get from your violence is the destruction of another person or another society if you have a fire and you want to put it out you don't put more oil on the fire or put more logs in the fire you slowly take the logs out of the fire to cool it down but fighting violence with more violence or countering violence with violence just makes a bigger fire the power of nonviolence is the same power that moves the entire universe, the natural power that's given within each of us to unfold and to develop our fullest potential and to spread a feeling of peace and harmony. And that's where the power of the individual lies. Some young people demonstrate for peace, and others seek it in the artificial solace of drugs. Here in New York, Swami Satchidananda teaches another way to peace. And on Friday evenings, he helps both young and old in the age-old battle to control the mind, which is the power of yoga, its application to the problems of daily living. To change the world, the Swami teaches, we must first change ourselves as individuals. And from the peace within, comes a power for peace in the world outside. That is the main purpose of yoga. Yoga expects one to reform himself. It is impossible to reform outside without having that reformation within ourselves. We talk a lot about peace. Everywhere there seems to be the cry. Occasionally, or even very often, we hear people shouting in the name of peace that they want to fight for peace. I really don't understand how they are going to fight to find the peace. Fighting is just the opposite of peace. The moment you start fighting for something, you are disturbing it. So instead of fighting for the peace, you should find peace. Without peace in the mind, we can't give peace to the outside world. In the whole world, the Swami is one of a handful of master teachers in yoga, and since 1949 has organized yoga centers throughout the world, including several across the country. Far from being removed from the human scene, he has immersed himself in it, drawing insights from contacts with the young, finding satisfaction in physical labor, inspiration from nature, and joy from his followers. The magnetic impact of the Swami in the United States prompted him to stay on after only a two-day visit in 1966. And today, he's a resident of New York and the founder and director of the Integral Yoga Institute located on West End Avenue, where each week thousands have encountered a new form of personal discipline designed to elevate and expand their capabilities to cope with problems. While the practice of yoga is derived from the ancient cultures of the East, Integral Yoga is a scientific system developed by the Swami, its method explained by Hari Zupin, his secretary. 
The integral yoga works with the physical aspect of the, the individual by giving yoga postures, which make the body healthy, supple, strong, and relaxed, and charging the nerves with more energy, and making the glands healthy, which in turn act on the personality and the emotionality. We all know if adrenaline is splashed into the system, it directly affects the emotions. And the practice of meditation works directly on the mind itself, which is another aspect of integral yoga. It makes the mind calm. It makes it peaceful. It collects all of the energy that is usually going in so many directions and focuses it in one place. Do you think it's related to self-hypnosis? Not at all. Hypnosis is where you relinquish the control, where you're not in control of your own faculties, where you can't direct them. This is just the opposite, where you begin to get in touch with your faculties, perhaps for the first time, and direct them towards a higher goal. You, you control the show. You're the director and the actor at the same time. From the pressures of the business world to the constant nagging problems of domestic life, the practice of meditation and the yogic way of life have very practical values. You really have to have a lot of strength, you know, behind you. And that's what yoga really shows me, that by doing all of those practices, I am a stronger person. I'm able to, to have a keener mind, to be able to, you know, be a good mother. I have to work, and um, as most people, you know, that work, mothers that work, it's, it's really difficult to take care of a child and, and take care of a husband and take care of yourself. But uh, I've learned, you know, by doing my practice, that I'm able to, you know, function during the day. Well, since I've been studying yoga and uh, been actively involved in the business world, I'm a real estate broker for one of the larger firms in Manhattan. I find my approach to business and my approach to communicating my product has been increased, I would say, 100%. The success of the Institute's program with young drug addicts has attracted the city to utilize yoga postures and meditation in its narcotics rehabilitation center, Horizon House and it has employed one of Swami's instructors, himself a former drug addict, Guru Prem, to conduct the classes. Feel the air just flow in and then flow out, going through the three parts of the body. Many people, hundreds and thousands, have come here with the idea of getting rid of drugs, uh, with the idea of they would even approach Swami and just sit as lectures and expect to hear him say, well, you must stop the practice of drugs. Simply coming in here and doing the yoga postures, ex increasing your appetite, expanding your lung capacity, getting some of the smoke out of, your, out of your brain, getting rid of all the accumulations of years of drug taking or bad habits, in itself just pushes the drugs out the window. And because at where the drugs might have been such a preoccupation in your mind, you almost forget that you ever had a problem because you're involved in such a positive way of living that the drugs, it's, a, it's just like you forget about it, just like the dirty diapers you wore when you were a kid. Well, I was brought up, uh, you know, uh, Episcopalian, you know, I went to church every day until I was eight years old or whatnot. There was always a ritual, but I never really understood beyond the ritual, the real meaning was. And people kept telling me, go to Sunday school, be good, and then they'd turn around and be cruel to each other and drink too much or what have you. And so there was a tremendous contradiction as a child being brought up in a so-called Christian world and seeing the lack of Christianity uh, that human beings had towards each other. So religion for me was somewhat of a mystery. You know, I, I couldn't quite fit myself into my upbringing. So I did rebel very strongly. Um, when I was 17, I decided not to go to college and do what I should have done according to my uh, uh, parents and friends and what have you. And I wanted to be an artist and I painted all my life and I also wanted to try acting. So I did that. I acted and I painted. But I didn't do it, you know, like to make money. I did it to break down the whole establishment, you know. But maybe that in itself made me uh, step outside and look at my fellow artists and see, are we really helping or hurting things by freaking out society so much? Everyone is free to do what he wants, no doubt. But your freedom should not interfere with the freedom of others. See? 
discipline should be properly understood. There is a coordination. It should work together. That togetherness is called discipline. You do things in a proper way, in an orderly way. That is what you call discipline. To achieve anything and everything. If the steering is not there, you can't drive the car. So there is a control. That's what you call this. You discipline the wheels with the steering. See, you discipline the current through this cable. Unfortunately, this freedom is very much misunderstood. People think, oh, let me do anything I want. Once I was driving from one town to the other town, in the middle of the road, a few people were sitting and playing cards. <laughs> in the middle of the road. So I parked the, stopped the car and walked out and said, what are you doing? Free country. <laughs> huh? 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 I must have my freedom to do anything I want. Actually, that uh, uh, in their language, uh, they mean people's government. It's not an imperialism, people's government. So we are all the rulers, I can do anything I want. I see. I am also a person belonging to your, this country. Oh, you can do anything you want. Fine, then I want to drive over you. <laughs> <laughs> Shall I? Then they... I woke up and, oh yeah, <laughs> I can't stop you from your freedom. <laughs> that is where we misunderstand the freedom. You are free to cooperate with others, to see that there is peace and joy everywhere. You are not free to disturb the other man or the world outside. There is a discipline within the freedom. That should be very well understood. I, I can't explain it. Everyone has their own personal reaction to him. But I had been practicing yoga since September without a teacher. And a couple of friends of mine said, well, that's all very well, you know, and you feel better physically and everything. But you can't beat having a teacher, a spiritual teacher, you know. And I was skeptical and I didn't really know what they meant. And then I went to the Universalist Church where he speaks on Fridays. and. Uh, Something happened to me that I, I cannot, uh, this is what happens, you know, it's, um, it's, it's, it's like you suddenly see that, that he doesn't think more or, or less of anybody, everyone he treats with the same amount of love. And all my life I had thought, well, certain people are educated more or no more. And it's like, there's no difference. I suddenly realized for the first time, and I'm like 27, you know, that we're all the same. No one is better than anyone else, and no one is uh, inferior to anyone else. And I didn't realize that until I came up, and my friend was introducing me, and I thought, well, is he going to treat me any differently than his own disciples, who he's known for years? Or is he going to treat me maybe better than someone else because he likes my face or something? And I realized that, that no, I had met the only person in my entire life that treated me with the same amount of love that he did people he'd known for years. The first time, you know? And, and I, I blew my mind, you know? So that when I left him, I suddenly began to look at everyone as the same and see myself in them and see them in me and no longer was there that sense of, of individuality to a positive or a negative degree. It was like everybody was, uh, we all had God in us and we were all one. <laughs>